Kevin Costner stars as Stephen Simmons, who comes back from military service in uh, Vietnam to Mississippi, uh, rural Mississippi, 1970s. Uh, well, he's getting, he, he takes the family, to the, his wife and daughter and, and son to uh, the fair, and while he's getting cotton candy, his son gets beaten up by the neighborhood bullies. Rather than retaliate against the bullies, he gives them their cotton candy, and they are shocked. Uh, love always surprises. This is the eighth in our series of messages called Standing Firm in Hard Times. The Apostle Peter is writing to first century Christians who are facing hard times. They are being persecuted for their faith, losing their jobs, uh, some are even being killed, and they're asking Peter questions like, should we tell people that we follow Jesus? Should we share our faith in Jesus? Or will we just get mocked? Will we just lose our jobs and be persecuted? How should we respond to people who are persecuting us and treating us so badly? Should we lash back? And Peter says, no. Love them. You love the people in your family. Remember, this is first generation Christianity. There are families where maybe one or two have given their lives to Christ and others do not. So some people are facing mocking within their own family. He says, love people in the church when you gather together to worship. And you love people that persecute you. In what I consider the most famous verse in the book of 1 Peter, chapter 4, verse 8, he says, Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. You guys want to memorize the verse? Okay, just repeat after me. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Well, I was just checking. I thought maybe you were reading it. You guys did very well. Love covers a multitude of sins. I think that can be interpreted two ways. One, it covers a multitude of my sins, our sins. Maybe I make a lot of mistakes. Maybe I do a lot of things wrong, things that are sinful. But if I love people in my family, my neighborhood, where I work, it covers over a lot of my own sins. I think it can also mean love covers over a lot of other people's sins. Your mate does things that irritate you. Love would help you to overlook those. Somebody at school does things that irritate you. Love would help you overlook that. Your neighbor does some things. Love would help you overlook what your neighbor does. I'll bet most of you here have a neighbor that irritates you. Could be right next door. Could be across the street. Could be a few houses down. They move in. You decide to be friendly. You take them a, a plate of cookies. They seem like a great family. Then the next day, they, you see them drive out, and they have a bumper sticker on their car for a presidential candidate, of which you do not approve. Or maybe the next day, they, they show something else a little weird. Love helps you overlook those differences. To Christians who are facing persecution and wondering how to respond, Peter tells them love covers a multitude of sins. Peter tells them four ways love covers a multitude of sins. These four are so simple. Turn to the person sitting next to you and say, even you can do this. All right, afterwards, I'll take some questions. So as I'm talking, you think of something, jot it down. First, love helps us make an all-out attempt to be done with sin. 1 Peter 4, verse 1, Therefore, 
Since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. What does Peter mean? You suffer, you're persecuted, then you're done with sin? I mean, how does that work? It can't possibly be what Peter means because he starts off by saying it's, it's about Christ. Since Christ suffered in his body. Suffered is in uh, the past tense. It's an event that's finished. So he's talking about the cross. Jesus suffered on the cross. Then he says is done with sin. That's an ongoing condition determined by a past event. Peter's talking about one act of suffering that results in sin being finished. So he's talking about Christ's death on the cross when he was died and buried and then raised again. He was finished with sin. He defeated sin for all time. Then he applies it to us. He says, arm yourselves with the same attitude. Just as Christ finished the defeat of sin through his death on the cross, we are to die to sin. Back in chapter 2, verse 24, it says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. Apostle Paul says in Romans 6, uh, 8, Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Verse 11, In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Say, we are to count ourselves dead to sin. We don't want to live in the sins for which Christ died. Verse 2 of chapter 4. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. Peter calls us to live the rest of our lives not for evil human desires, but in obedience to the will of God. One lady wrote to Dear Abby, I'd like to meet a man with no bad habits. Abby writes back, so would I. (laughs) We all have bad habits. With the power of the Holy Spirit, Peter calls us to be done with these sinful behaviors. Verse 3, for you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. Peter writes to Christians who are turning to Christ and are leaving their past life behind, and their friends are mocking them for the changes they're making in their life. He says, don't buckle in to your friend's pressure. Be done with sin. It's so bad you want to leave it behind. Love for Christians, or love for Christ, moves us to no no longer want to live in the sins for which he died. Love for people motivates us to be done with sin so we don't keep hurting them by our sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. Two, love helps us live wisely in light of the coming judgment. Verse 5, but they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Some people are saying to Peter, Peter, some people, they lived a pretty good life. They were sinful. They didn't follow God. And they died. They never got judged. And Peter says, well, Jesus will someday come and he will judge the living and the dead Everyone will stand before him. I mean, that alone is a message to be shared. Every person you know, every person in the world will someday stand before Jesus Christ. That's a message to share. What are you doing with Jesus Christ? What are you doing with your life? You have to stand before Jesus someday. Verse 6, for this reason... For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. The end of all things is near, therefore be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. New Testament writers consistently declare that the end of time is near. You say that seems odd. They were saying that 2,000 years ago and the end still hasn't come. Well, the way the Bible divides time, it's, it's creation to the coming of Christ, 
And then from Christ's death and resurrection to the forward is called the end of time. Now that makes sense. If you look at the distance from creation to Christ's coming is much longer than the years since then. So we are in the end times. We are nearer to Christ's return than we have ever been before. It could be any day. Love for Christ and for people causes us want to live wisely each day. We don't want to be embarrassed. Christ comes and we're doing something that we're mortified to be doing. Verse 7 again, the end of all things is near, therefore be alert and of sober mind that you may pray. I think Peter is thinking of Gethsemane, remember? Jesus said, Peter, watch, sit here, stay alert while I go and pray. He came back and Peter was asleep. Jesus told him again, sit and stay alert. And he went to pray, came back, found him asleep again. Peter's saying, stay alert so you can pray. We're in the end times. Love pushes us to want to live wisely each day. Love covers a multitude of sins. Three, love deeply ministers to people. Verse 8, above all, he says, if you get anything out of this message, wake up now, this is important. Above all, love each other deeply. Because love covers a multitude of sins. You may not get a lot of things right in your life, but if you love people, that will cover over for a lot of mistakes you make. Do you see how important it is that we be a loving church? We may not do everything right. We may not have all the bells and whistles, but if we love people, it'll cover over a lot of things we don't do well. We need to love everyone who comes here. Everyone that is invited, we welcome them with open arms. We don't care what they've done, what they look like, where they've been. We need to welcome gays. Welcome them into our community groups. Studies show that most people with same-sex attraction had a poor relationship with a father. Maybe no relationship or a bad relationship. Or they had an early sexual experience. Most of them had same-sex attraction from early days in their life. Are we going to judge them for that? Things that, over which they had practically no control? I've learned that churches that speak out against homosexuality off, usually don't speak about divorce much. They don't speak about adultery much or pornography, things that are going on in the church. Church is always in the business of drawing lines and building bridges. We believe Jesus. We believe He's the Son of God raised from the dead, and He says all of Scripture is true, Old and New Testament. So we believe everything it says. The, the Bible is very clear. The marriage is between a man and a woman. We can't draw back from that. We hold to that, but we build bridges to people of same-sex attraction and welcome them and love them. Verse 9, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. God calls us to be hospitable to everyone. Philip Yamsey in his book, The Question That Never Goes Away, cites a study at a university where they were finding out how long people could sit with their feet in freezing cold water. They found if a companion joined them, they could put their feet in the water for twice as long. The presence of one other caring person helps us handle double the amount of pain in our lives. Yet in our pain-denying and death-denying culture, we do just the opposite. People that are sick and suffering, we put them in hospitals. We put them in nursing homes. Two-thirds of people die in one of those two places often alone. God calls us to love all people. Come beside people who are struggling. Often our efforts to love other people actually draw other people to Christ. In the book, I Am In, 
which is I Am a Follower of the Nazarene. It's a book about Christians living in Muslim-majority countries, mostly the Middle East and Africa. These are, some of them are Muslims who converted to Christians and how they're persecuted, how they're treated, and how tough it is. A guy named Hassan lived in Erbil, or lives in Erbil, Iraq. Uh, Iraq, Erbil is a city that's mushroomed over the last two years with many refugees, mostly from Mosul. We estimate that one million refugees have left Syria and Iraq and come into Europe. 2.5 million have left Syria and Iraq and come into Lebanon, Turkey, or Jordan. And we estimate 4.5 million refugees have moved within Syria and Iraq to other places. And Erbil is one of those places that's received many, many people. Asher, another man who lives in Erbil, is a Christian. And he is always looking for opportunities to talk to his Muslim friends about Jesus and get into conversations. Every attempt he made with Esan, was, was, there was pushback. Esan was not interested and he... Uh, you know, he'd ask questions like, well, how can Jesus be fully God and fully man? And it seemed like whatever Asher answered, it, it didn't satisfy. He said, Christians killed Muslims during the Crusades, and they're hypocrites. They claim to be pure, but they live impure lives. And Asher said, well, not everybody who claims to be a Christian really is. And yes, there are a lot of hypocrites. Well, when ISIS came into Mosul in June of 2014, thousands of people fled, and many of them went to Erbil. And when they did, Azure led an effort of Christians to serve those people. They would fill bags with food and clothing and hygiene items, and they would always put a Bible in there. And Ezan watched and uh, kind of watched from a distance and one day, uh, Azure said to him, would you like to help us? He hesitated, and they said, okay. So they worked all day, nine hours. They didn't even take a break for lunch. And at the end of the day, uh, Azure asked him, would you like to go to dinner with us? And he did. And during dinner, he, he asked, what kind of God gives you love like that to serve people you don't even know? Where do you get the love to care about people like that. Azure thought maybe he was going to answer, ask other questions, so he didn't really answer him. And as on, you know, kept asking questions, it became clear that serving with him that day had kind of turned a corner for him. He said, well, the God, you just saw today that there is a God who gives us the strength and the love to care about other people. And Ezan said, why do you put Bibles in the bags? And he said, could I have one? And I was sure gave him one. He says, why don't you read Matthew? And just start there. And if you have any questions, write them down or, or call me. And then call me in the morning. So the next morning, Ezan didn't call. And it was getting later and later in the day. Finally, it was 11 a.m. And he thought he'd better call him. And he calls him. And Ezan said, I was up all night reading. Jesus revealed himself to me. Now I want to take the next step and be baptized and serve other people like you. It was seeing Christians serve people they didn't even know that turned the corner for his on and he came to Christ. Love covers a multitude of sins. And fourth, love motivates us to serve others Verse 10, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Chris Quinn says this every Sunday, we want people to gather, grow, and serve. Here he, Peter says it, You're supposed to, we're all supposed to serve. Then he zeroes in on two different ways we can serve. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If you're going to speak, if you have a gift that involves teaching or some sort of communication, speak understanding what Scripture says, that all Scripture is inspired by God. You're speaking the very words of God. If you don't believe that, nobody else will. 
If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. If you're serving, depend on the strength that God supplies. We're apt to think that if we're teaching, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. But if we're serving, we can do that on our own strength. We may agree that the ministry of the Word needs special grace, but preparing food, packing backpacks for McKay, serving in the sound booth or PowerPoint, or ushering or greeting people, these are just matters of rolling up our sleeves and getting to work. Peter says, no, no. If God is to be glorified by ministry in His name, it must be performed in His strength. Liz wants to come up here. So Liz uh, heads up our hospitality ministry, our food ministry, and uh, every Sunday I get here, she's already here before me. She got here at 740 this morning. Yeah. Probably will leave about 130 today, mm -hmm. every Sunday. And uh, she's buzzing around in the kitchen. She usually has Char Neal and so maybe somebody else helping her. And you always have a smile. I do. So I really believe you are doing this on the power of the Holy Spirit, yes. working through you. And uh, she's usually here on Saturdays, preparing food. And, uh, you know, I come, out, I, I come out every day and I, every Sunday, and I, I look, I see people standing, eating, sitting, eating. And I, I think the food ministry is one of the strongest glues that makes this a friendly church. Yes, it is. So thank you for what you do. Yeah. <clears throat> In the post-Christian culture in which we live, I believe that the only way to reconquer America for Christ is through service. Uh, Philip Yancey in his book, uh, The Question That Never Goes Away, uh, I've, I've spoken of him before, he, he wrote a book, uh, Where Is God When It Hurts, years ago, and it was so popular, he's kind of become a go-to guy when there's a crisis, and he goes and speaks. So he went to Newtown, Connecticut, he went to Virginia Tech, you know, all, all these different places. He spoke to the people in Japan after the tsunami in March of 2011, in a country where less than 1% believe in Christ, where most people are atheists, agnostics, or nothing, or Buddhists, which are basically atheists. People that never talked about theological things, then that's all they wanted to talk about. And Yancey came and he saw, you know, one church that housed a thousand evacuees for months. He saw a group of construction workers retired who came to work to build houses for people who had lost their homes. And they worked in very cramped quarters and they'd work long hours. And before they turned the keys over to the owners, they would say, would you let us offer a prayer of blessing? And they were never turned down. The people of Japan most of whom are not believers, got an opportunity to look at Christ followers and, the diff and how hard they worked to serve that part of the country. John Marks, a producer for television 60 Minutes, went on a two-year quest to look at evangelicals. Evangelicals are people who believe that Jesus is the only way and, the, and that the Bible is true from cover to cover. And in, in his book, he wrote... It's called, One Man's Journey Among the Evangelicals and the Faith He Left Behind. Uh, he says, the church's response to Katrina is what turned things around for him. He had left his faith, and then when he saw, you know, one Baptist church in Baton Rouge, they served 16 meals to 16,000 people a day for months. Another church housed 700 evacuees for months. And he saw people come together to work and what really impressed him was that they were whites and blacks and Hispanics and Vietnamese and they all worked together. They didn't care. 
So we get some rice to cook. And so he writes, I would argue that this was a watershed moment in the history of American Christianity. Nothing spoke more eloquently to believers and to non-believers who were paying attention than the success of a population of believing volunteers measured against the massive and near total collapse of secular government efforts. The storm laid bare an unmistakable truth. More and more Christians have decided that the only way to reconquer America is through service. The faith no longer travels by the word, it moves by the deed. Love motivates us to serve others, and when we do, we can make a difference in the world. I believe our service to McKay and to people in financial crisis in our community may be the most important thing we're doing as a church. Love covers a multitude of sins. Love motivates us for the good of our relationship with God and people to make an all-out assault on sin so we don't continue to disappoint God and hurt people. Love pushes us to live each day wisely for we believe the final judgment is coming soon. Love motivates us to minister deeply to people in our homes, our schools, our places of work, and in our church. And love motivates us to serve people in our community. So this message for marriage, love your mate. Overlook the faults and love deeply. For single people, love your friends, your family. Overlook things that just don't matter and love them deeply. Teenagers, love your parents, your mom, your dad, your brothers and sisters. Don't let the fights destroy your home. Parent, you got a kid who's irritating you in some way, don't make that the biggest deal in the world. If you're going to err, err on the side of loving your son or daughter. Empty nester, love your mate, love your grandchildren if you have them. Employees, love the people you work with. Don't get so concerned about the things that irritate you with the others. Above all, love each other deeply, for love covers over a multitude of sins. All right, Art, should we do some questions? So if you've got a question, raise your hand. Maybe introduce yourself. And uh, the only rule is... Only softballs. Easy questions. Anybody? Look at that art. Nothing. Volunteer somebody. No, we don't need any. Don't need to make them up. Sorry. Okay, so let's pray. Father, thank you so much for uh, uh, Peter's words to us. Above all, love each other deeply. Help us keep that written where we see it and remember it, that this is the most important. So I want to give you a moment to respond. Maybe you want to recommit yourself to love the people in your life, people in the church, where you work, where you go to school. If you've never given your life to Christ, you could just say, Jesus, I ask you into my life today. I believe you rose from the dead. Come into my life. I'll give you a minute to pray. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray.